On behalf of the White House, thank you so much for joining us and being part of this incredible journey to, to develop uh, tomorrow's quantum workforce here in the United States. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Ponch and the National Science Foundation for their continued leadership and, and real commitment to, uh, to, to, to driving uh, QIS here, here in the United States. Since very early on in, in 2017, um, the Trump administration has prioritized quantum information science as, as really a key industry of the future. And we recognize that, that America's continued leadership in QIS means that the American people are going to benefit tremendously from quantum technologies in healthcare and communications, manufacturing beyond, and, and our nation will, will really enhance its own economic prosperity and national security for, for years to come. And, and that is why I think that the, the National Q12 Education Partnership and our continued emphasis on public and educational outreach is so, so critically important. Um, today, I, I want to begin, um, and I'm actually very excited to do this, to make a couple of key announcements um, uh, but before we kind of get into things. I think, first off, we are, are thrilled today to launch quantum.gov. This is the, the new online home for the National Quantum Coordination Office. On quantum.gov, you're going to find resources related to progress made on the National Quantum Initiative, all about the and learn all about the QIS activities that are happening across the federal government. Um, it's also a, a very important and, and valuable um, sort of one-stop shop for all of our latest announcements and 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 reports. It, it also builds upon the, the important mission of the National Q12 Education Partnership by making QIS more accessible to, to all. Um, the site has, has just gone live. You're the, the first to hear about it, and we're, uh, we're very, uh, we encourage all of you um, to, uh, to check it out and to, to, to share it um, far, far and wide. Um, uh, as you know, our activities in quantum span a wide number of agencies, from National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, and, and, uh, and NIST and beyond, and having one resource where the community can, can kind of see what, what we're up to uh, is, is, I think, very valuable. And, uh, and I think we're, we've been super, super excited to, to see it. And you can see the, uh, the new uh, really, uh, really cool steel that we've, we've made for the, uh, the coordination office as, as well. Um, now, dovetailing on that, the, the, the White House's National Quantum Coordination Office today is also releasing its Quantum Frontiers Report. And this report identifies eight fundamental questions relating to QIS, laying out priority R&D areas for the government, for the private sector, and academia to explore in order to accelerate quantum breakthroughs. And this is, this is a report that's been many months in the making. Uh, we've done this through close collaboration feedback with the entire quantum community, including uh, an RFI that many folks on this call may have, may have responded to, and, uh, and a series of workshops and, and roundtables. And the Quantum Frontiers Report really brings together the input we received from the entire innovation ecosystem, and including a number of, of next generation quantum leaders. Uh, to, and, and I think I, I encourage all of you to, to go take a look. Um, it's available on, on quantum.gov. And finally, uh, even more relevant than, than anything else uh, on, for this call today is uh, I have an update on the, on the National Q12 Education Partnership it, itself. We're very proud to announce uh, two new members, Intel and Honeywell, uh, and, and I want you all to join me in, in thanking and, and welcoming them. You know, we are absolutely thrilled, um, but the momentum for the partnership continues to build since, since it was launched just, uh, just a couple of months, a few months ago in, in, in July of this year. As many of you may, may be tracking, um, you know, the, the administration has, has made other important progress related to, to the National Quantum Initiative since, since that time as well. Um, from NSF's Quantum Challenge, uh, Quantum Leap uh, in Challenge Institutes to the Department of Energy's Quantum Research Centers, this summer um, we announced close to a, to a billion dollars in, um, in, in, in QIS R&D institutes across the country. Um, last month, the, the White House and NIST also announced the steering committee of the National Quantum Economic Development Consortium, which has kind of been tackling head-on the challenges of, of developing our, our workforce here in the U.S. and addressing a lot of the, a lot of the industry needs. Um, the other announcement you may have seen is that the White House joined the uh, Department of Energy in naming the members of our, our National Quantum Initiative Advisory Council. This was something that was called for in the legislation and sort of our, our external board of advisors on, on all things quantum. And I think together, all, all these announcements um, uh, really represent a, this, this really clear commitment on our part um, to, to drive American leadership in, in QIS. And, 
you know, to me, you know, I, I really believe that the, the national Q12 education partnership fills a critical need by, by expanding access to QIS themes and education to students who may not really have the opportunity to otherwise. Um, you know, we believe that early engagement with emerging technology is essential to inspire and grow the next generation of, of, uh, of the American workforce. We know that the government can't address these challenges alone, and, and I, I, I really want to thank everyone on this call and everyone in the private sector and academia and education community who are, who are partnering with us to, to make this a reality. Um, we are so excited to see how, how, to see how others here today can join and support this and, and really drive the, the quantum workforce efforts. Um, I think we have a very unique opportunity to make a difference, and I, and I encourage the, the partnership to, to really think big. I'm eager to hear how, how we at the White House can, um, can, can help in any way. Um, before, um, before I wrap, I, I, I want to take a second and, and recognize the students joining us um, uh, from Mr. Hannum's Quantum Mechanics and Electrodynamics course at, at Thomas Jefferson High School for Science and Technology in, in Fairfax, Virginia. Um, when I heard you guys, what guys were joining, um, you know, when when I was uh, before I got super involved in in the technology world back in high school, I was uh, I was I was uh, a participant and aspiring diplomat in in Mall UN and, and a lot of conferences. We always uh, came head to head with you guys and and always seemed to be on the wrong side of that competition. But in any case, you are a, a brilliant set of students, and uh, and and I'm I'm so glad you could you could be here today to to join us. It's it's really a unique and, and special opportunity to learn about QIS before college. Um, uh, and of course, you know, we're hoping that we can create more and more opportunities like, like those at Thomas Jefferson around, uh, around the country. So thank you guys for, for taking time out of your day to, 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 to join this. Um, next, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely pleased to, to turn it over to uh, the National Science Foundation Director, uh, uh, Dr. Ponch, um, after he was uh, you know, he's been such an, an, an inspiration to so many scientists and, and technologists and students across across the country for for many years, and and we could not have been more thrilled to to, to see him fly through the the confirmation process here here in Washington. And and the National Science Foundation has played a, an absolutely essential hand in in the launch of Quantum.gov and of course in the creation and the continued advancement of the of the partnership. So thank you uh, so much for allowing me to be, be part of this today, for all your efforts you're doing, and, uh, and, and thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, with that, I'd like to pass it off to you, uh, Ponch. Thank you so much, Michael. I just want to acknowledge your tremendous leadership as the U.S. Chief Technology Officer, what you have done and what the White House of Science and Technology Policy has done to advance this very, very important area is truly inspiring. And uh, you know, we are very grateful to you, Michael, uh, for all that you do. And uh, it is indeed exciting to be with all of you today as we kick off the National Q212 Education Partnership. I have no doubt that it will certainly ensure a great future for the US SME enterprise. What a week and what a day. We just had the Nobel laureates yesterday in physics and today in chemistry, and I'm so proud to see the NSF funded investigators achieve this highest level of recognition in science. So when I think about this and the contextualization to th today, this Q to 12 education partnership now is going to unleash unbelievable talent and potential that's going to be the Nobel laureates of the future. And I'm looking forward to that level of intensity of um, what we will be able to do with this announcement today. And I'm truly excited to be part of this announcement. Quantum is indeed an exciting focus area of the industries of the future. And through this partnership, we will work to ensure everyone in the US has access to bring their ideas and talent to advance us into the future. As you know, Quantum offers great potential for economic prosperity and national security. We must inspire talent and spark curiosity in every corner of our nation, from coast to coast, from remote rural areas, to the largest urban centers. We have talent everywhere across this great nation. This partnership brings together the federal government, industry, professional societies, and the education community. I am therefore confident that together, we will grow the number and diversity of students inspired and prepared to engage in quantum information science. We will reach students early in their educational endeavors Great to have the Jefferson High School students join us today, as Michael said. What an ex excellent example 
of how we inspire students to this already, while empowering at the same time educators with curricula and accessible tools to develop lifelong quantum learners. At NSF, we inspire STEM curiosity, support early education, and work to increase STEM access. We also empower emerging technologies to spark interest in STEM. Our support for QIS runs really deep. Decades of NSF investments in physics, chemistry, material sciences, computer science and engineering, and more have benefited quantum researchers and educators. Through our Quantum Leap program, we foster convergent approaches to STEM education. Now, the National Q-12 Education Partnership will enable the best approaches and activities and evidence-based strategies to increase diversity in QIS education. I would like to shine a spotlight on the team supporting this exciting Q-12 Education Partnership. The Q-2 Work Program coordinates and leads by supporting the education ecosystem with digital tools, outreach, and collaborative workshops. Dr. Emily Edwards from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and Professor Diana Franklin from the University of Chicago lead this exciting NSF-funded program. I want to express our gratitude to both for their phenomenal work. Another key part of the program is online education hub that will help connect resources to educators and learners across the nation. It will foster literacy in K-12 and ultimately across all ages and learning environments. I want to therefore commend the cross-division support within the NSF for making these efforts possible. It is an unbelievable amount of intensity, intentionality, and work that has gone into this that has made this day possible. I want to express my special thanks to Tomas Durkovich for his leadership and contributions. So thank you, Tomas. Today marks a milestone in QIS education and the workforce of the future for our great nation. Again, I am excited by this launch and look forward to amazing outcomes in the future. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you so much, Michael and Director Panchanathan for your leadership and support and for sharing the exciting updates, uh, clearly demonstrating that the momentum and enthusiasm for QIS continues to grow. And most importantly, we all have a role to play in this enterprise. Exciting times ahead. Now, for the presentation of the Q12 partnership vision, uh, we ask Assistant Director for QIS at White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and Director of National Quantum Coordination Office, Dr. Charlie Tahan, to um, present uh, the vision. Thank you, Tomas. And thank you, Michael and Dr. Panchanathan. We really, I mean, let me extend my thanks to NSF and, and Tomas and, and all the activities and support you've given us. We really appreciate it. I'm really excited to be here today uh, to kick off the Q12 partnership. I think we can do more than the sum of our parts in this area in Q12 education and, and quantum education. We have a real opportunity to do something special. When I started here at OSTP and became the director of the National Quantum Coordination Office, outreach and education were two of my primary areas I wanted to focus on. You know, I'm the son of an immigrant and I wanted to become a physicist. That only happened because I had experience and opportunities that let me make that possible, you know, from my parents on down. So I, I'd like everybody to see that, to get those kind of opportunities. And, and that's really what this is a part, this is about. I want to first recognize the people on the call today who we have. We have our founding industry partners for the q partner, partnership, IBM, Google, Lockheed Martin, Amazon, Zapata, Montana Instruments, Rigetti, Microsoft, Boeing. Thank you for being our initial supporters. We have the nonprofit members, the American Physical Society, IEEE, Optical Society of America, SBIE. It is critically important that you're a part of this too. And we have the new members, Honeywell and Intel. Really great to have you on board as well. And also our academic partners, Emily and Diana, um, from Q2Work, funded by NSF. I'll be talking about them more in a minute. 
I also want to highlight all the representatives from government we have. We have our workforce working group on quantum calling in, led by NSF and the Lab for Physical Sciences, and representatives from all the 13 agencies who participate in the White House subcommittees on quantum and care about workforce development on the line. The, the base goal of Q12 is to encourage the growth of a community of educators and organizations connecting with early learners, with students. Each member brings their unique resources. This is the kickoff. It's the first nuts and bolts meeting. So we're going to get in the second half and in the last two hours, we're going to have candid discussions about what we actually want to do. But the event in the, this morning, the first hour is about bringing this community together to increase the awareness of the Q12 partnership and the needs of the QIS education ecosystem. Um, and also to talk about concrete next steps and best practices for how we can be most impactful. We have high school teachers, an entire high school class, academic researchers, members of teaching societies, professional societies, federal agencies, all on the, on the line today. Welcome, we really appreciate you being here. Um, please give us your feedback after today. We'd love to hear from you. So let me, um, I wanna start by just telling you where we are and how we got here. So let me share some, some screens, share. Okay. All right, I'm Charlie Tahan. If you don't know me already, hello. Quantum information science. So why are we here? To me, quantum information science is one of the most exciting developments in physics and computer science in the last 50 years, if not more. It is extremely rare to be living through a shift in our understanding of how the universe works that at the same time has the potential for such dramatic technology impact new types of sensors, simulators, quantum computers, and quantum networks that link them together. IT, information technology, makes up a huge fraction of our economy, and quantum information changes our very notion of what information science is, the very principles of information science. That has to have dramatic consequences long-term. We already have a few examples, but the field is still new, and new ideas are coming out every day. But to do this, we need people. We need really good people, and we don't have enough right now. There are great careers in quantum right now in many different organizations above, across public and private uh, organizations. But we, can, we can't hire people fast enough. You know, when I, 20 years ago when I was a graduate student, this was not necessarily true. But now, in my position in government, I can't hire people fast enough, nor can companies or national labs and other organizations who want to hire this kind of talent. You know, just to give you an example, there's almost 40 companies working on quantum computing in the U.S. today, and you go out and look at the job ads, there's at least 140 advertisements for quantum-specific jobs. We don't even graduate that many PhDs in quantum information a year in this country. So there's a real need, and we need to solve it. And the government um, took deliberate the U.S. government took deliberate action along these lines in the last couple of years. The leadership here at OSTP through Michael, the National Quantum Initiative and other legislation, coordinated efforts between the federal agencies on subcommittees and working groups and in the National Quantum Coordination Office here in the White House, have all been working with growing this quantum workforce as a primary objective. The launch of quantum.gov is just a great example. It's, a fa it's the face of this effort. Um, and the Q12 kickoff today is, a, is, a, is another example of how we can reach a national audience if we work together. So you've already heard that the National Quantum Initiative has set up new, new centers, new quantum information science centers. All the agencies have started new programs. There's a tremendous amount of funding coming in from industry. All across the nation, there's a lot of funding for research and development of quantum technologies. So this means a lot of funding is going to graduate students, postdocs, researchers. What we saw that was missing was opportunities before college. You know, how do we engage with K-12 education with students um, before they make their decision on, on what to do in their life um, to, to help bring them into this community and educate them? So in May, um, let me just give you a little bit of the history over the last six months as we got to this point where we are now. In May, NSF, 
uh, hosted a core concepts workshop, which looks at develop which looked at developing core concepts for curricular and educator activities in quantum information science. The output of that wasn't an introduction to quantum information science. The output of it was a framework that we can build upon to develop actual curricula for all levels of education. And another thing that came out of that meeting from the community itself was a request to expand those core co concepts and connect them to actual learners. That motivated the Q12, the Q2Work program, which NSF uh, also funds. Um, the Q2Work program enables academic research through a grant to start supporting this QIS education community. So as Dr. Panchanathan said, Emily and Deanna are the real leaders here. They are the principal investigators on this Q2Work grant, which facilitates um, the partnership, but also supports and is designed to be agile to support the growing needs of this QIS edu education community as it grows over time. They deserve all the credit, credit as, it, as does NSF and Tomas, so, you know, thank you very much. A main objective of, of the q work program, and I'm representing NSF and, and Deanna and Emlyn here, so they deserve all the credit, but a main objective is to develop a curated website of educational materials that can be useful across the nation. Um, with the long-term goal of educating and, and inspiring a future diverse workforce for quantum. This is a multi-year and very serious effort to help develop real and useful material for the classroom. And that brings me to the Q12 partnership. So when we started sharing this idea with companies and organizations about linking industry with education researchers and teachers, it was not a hard sell. You know, a commitment to contribute to Q12 education and beyond over the life of the National Quantum Initiative, which is 10 years, just makes a lot of sense. It helps all of us, um, you know, help with our, our, with our recruiting needs. But you all went further and you named some real things you're going to do. Some of those things um, you were going to do anyway, develop educational materials and so on. But some of those things you named were things you needed help with. And that's the whole point of the partnership, to elevate problems and missing pieces to a partnership where we can all work together to solve them. So in the last slide, let's let, me, let me talk to you about what I think our charge is as a Q12 community and partnership. We, in a humble way, you know, we have to decide how impactful we want to be. We have a, a tremendous opportunity here. You know, the brain power, the resources of the organizations in this room across the public and private sector, sectors is immense. And we need to decide how, once we decide how we want to do things, we can work quickly to amplify and scale those activities to a national and glo global activity. So if we, global level. So if we can do that, we should. I've been told a few times in my career, do only what only you can do. I think about that a lot. I often ignore it, <laughs> but I think it's really relevant here because this group and only this group working together can do certain amazing things. We need to find those things and do them. So it's, as we think about what our metrics of success will be a year from now, three years from now, in addition to picking a few specific activities to commit to, one of those metrics may be how many intercompany, interagency teams have we made? You know, I love to see Skunkworks efforts on really cool projects. So to me, success is educate, inspire, experiences, career. You know, it starts with having great careers in quantum and telling, showing people that there are great careers in all different ways, and there are many different ways you can contribute. And building on that is how do we educate people, inspire them to get into quantum, and give them real experiences to show that they too can contribute something unique and useful. I, I want to end just by saying efforts like the Q12 initiative and all the government programs only work because great people are willing to serve in the government. And we are very fortunate to have some great people, people here in the National Coordination Office. Alex Cronin, who's, who is our senior quantum coordinator, and next up, uh, Corey Stambaugh, who's our industry liaison and runs our workforce working group and other workforce activities. We are extremely lucky to have them. We need more people like them and perhaps someone like you to, to come and work in the government. So off to you, Corey. Uh, thanks very much. I, I hope we're gonna have a great day. Thank you so much.
Charlie, for the inspiring words and um, excellent uh, reminder of what the partnership stands for. Uh, we will now switch to the panel discussion of QIS education. And for that part, let me welcome the unstoppable force of enthusiasm and volcano of skills, also known to many as Cory Stambaugh from the National Quantum Coordination Office. Cory, take it away. So Masha, you're, you're, you're too kind. Um, uh, thank you, Charlie. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. You know, I hope the first part of today's program really gives you an understanding of what the partnership and the Q12 effort is really trying to accomplish at the national level. Today, we brought together a nice panel to try to help you understand the, the needs for a diverse and interdisciplinary workforce, the challenges and successes to connecting to high school students, along with how we can support the teacher and how we can broaden and expand the effort. Um, I put up on the slide here, I'm gonna turn it on in a minute, but this is our great panel that we're gonna be interacting with. We have James Whitfield from Dartmouth, Krista Savor from Microsoft, Chandralaka Singh from University of Pittsburgh, and Gabriel Gonzalez from the Intel Foundation. So I don't want to waste too much time, but I'd rather jump to the panelist. Um, but before I do, I do wanna make one comment. This is a great panel because it's diverse in terms of skills. We have electrical engineer, a physicist, a chemist, and a computer scientist. There's probably a joke in there, but I will stay away from it. So let me just start with uh, Krista, if you could maybe start and give us a minute or so background on how you're connected to the Q12 community. Great. Thank you, Corey, and thank you for the invitation uh, to be here today. It's a pleasure to be a part of this fantastic program. And I'm really excited to see what we will do together, the ideas we'll generate today and what we'll commit to. So I'm Krista Savori. I'm a quantum computer scientist by night, and I'm the general manager of quantum systems at Microsoft by day. I first learned about quantum computing in a seminar by Andrew Wiles. If you're a STEM fan, you know Andrew Wiles. He solved for Ma's last theorem. I first learned about quantum computing in a seminar uh, that he gave at Princeton in the late 90s. And I became absolutely fascinated by this model of computation, that it could do things that we couldn't do with our classical digital conventional computers. And so I jumped in, pursued a PhD in quantum computing from the computer science side. And now I am so honored to be leading a team and working with such an amazing group of people to help uh, ensure that this technology will come about and have impact on some of our most challenging problems in this world. At Microsoft, we are committed to education. Uh, we have a variety of programs around education, and we're also committed to seeing quantum computing come forward as a disruptive technology for changing our world. So I'm excited to share aspects of that today in the panel. And of course, members of uh, our, our team will be in the breakout sessions uh, to dig in a little deeper. So thank you, Corey, for the invitation. Again, pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Krista. James, could you maybe tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, I'm uh, James Whitfield. I'm very glad to be here uh, among such esteemed company. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at Dartmouth. I've been there for about four years. I'm working on quantum information science, thinking about how to do quantum simulation of electrons and fermions, thinking about how to do encodings, a lot of different technical aspects there. But most of the theory side, um, I've been in quantum computing for um, over a decade. Um, doing research, um, and now at Dartmouth, we have quantum information science at Dartmouth with a number of faculty there trying to expand our profile, um, along with education, also doing outreach to high schools in the area, which um, one of my first, my first PhD student, uh, Kanaf Satia, graduated earlier this year, and with him, we've co-founded um, a small quantum startup um, about education, um, amongst other things, QBraid, where we're also trying to help uh, foster quantum education across the country. Sir. Thank you, James. Uh, Chandra? Hi, I'm uh, Chandra Lekha Singh from University of Pittsburgh. Uh, I am a physics professor there, and I'm also currently the president of the American Association of Physics Teachers. I am extremely passionate about improving student learning of quantum mechanics, and I've been working in this area for more than two decades. And uh, many of the things that we are working on actually relate to, I mean, like we are basically developing a lot of research validated learning tools that actually take into account the kind of challenges that students have in learning. 
And we are actually very, very interested in QIS concepts and many of the things that we have developed for college level students, for example, quantum key distribution, uh, interactive tutorials or mark center interferometer with single photons that can teach students about superposition and measurement, et cetera. We are thinking about how to adapt some of the, the things that we have developed to the K through 12 level. Now, I want to give a big shout out to uh, Mark Hannum, who's right now the, um, the project manager for K through 12 at the American Association of Physics Teachers and Karen Jo Messler, who's actually the director of the uh, physics teaching research agents, because the two, I'm working with the two of them as program evaluator because each of them has uh, an NSF grant to do professional development for K through 12 teachers. Uh, in this area of quantum information. And the point is that it's really true that right now we still need a lot of learning tools, you know, curricula and pedagogies and other things, but it's also time to dive in with whatever existing tools we have in these areas. And both Karen and Mark Hennem have done a tremendous job uh, with these professional developments so far, you know, like we have had to do everything remotely. And by the way, they are actually dealing with two different um, you know, uh, types of teachers. So Mark is actually doing stuff for uh, AP physics teachers and uh, honors teachers. And these are people who actually uh, are very conversant with mathematics. So he's using full-fledged linear algebra concepts, whereas Karen Joe's uh, thing, which is called quantum for all, is very conceptual in nature. So obviously we have a long way to go. We need to really think about how to adapt the learning tools you know, to very students at various levels and make them much better suited for their initial knowledge and how to make them actually become good at these things because we definitely need to get students excited about these fields. So Corey, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I, I will point out that on the line, we have several um, academics and teachers who are trying in their own local communities to connect to high schools and teach QIS. And so part of this is about bringing us together so we can learn from each other. Uh, Gabby. Hi. Hello, everybody. Again, it's a pleasure to be here and join you, joining you all this morning. Um, my name is Gabby Gonzalez. I am the Deputy Director of the Intel Foundation. And uh, I also want to thank Computing at Intel for making the connection to this initiative. I came into knowledge of the quantum computing initiative through conversations with Charlie, Corey, and Jim. And I was exciting, or I was very excited about the possibility of figuring out a way to support this initiative. Uh, my background, as uh, Charlie mentioned, is electrical engineering. I spent uh, the vast majority of my career in manufacturing, developing shop floor control systems, uh, uh, quality control systems, and uh, at Intel, working in the fabs, producing the greatest technology on earth. It, it's very exciting to, to see how emerging technologies can not only change lives, but can also enable students to dream big. And that's what really uh, brought me on board from uh, the Intel Foundation side is to see how we can better serve uh, the students that that uh, can uh, contribute all of the big ideas that are going to uh, make a difference for all of us in the future. I also have sort of a double hat. Uh, I'm also the chair of the National Science Foundation STEM education panel. So I am happy to be part of the panel today and thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you all. So I think the first question I, I wanted to start with was to ask about what, what is the need for, for a quantum workforce and especially early engagement. And I always like to think as a physicist, how do we extend beyond physics? And so I wanted to start with Krista, if she could maybe start there and then hear some commentary from everyone else on the panel. Great. Thanks, Corey. Yeah, I think often when we think of, of quantum information, the word quantum makes us think that it's very focused, you know, towards towards just physics. And as I mentioned, I, I came at this field from the computer science side, uh, actually originally the mathematics side. I, I majored in mathematics as an undergraduate and then took a, a pivot to take the computer science angle because I wanted to learn how we could actually program and uh, implement algorithms on such a machine uh, when we 
when you know when when able. So we started. I started very early thinking about programming such a computer, uh, and and uh, learned about quantum computing without really ever learning quantum mechanics. Uh, so so it is possible, <laughs> uh, and I think that's a great challenge for all of us today. You know, how do you bring this subject to high schoolers, even to middle schoolers and earlier, right, uh, to kindergartners, right, um, without requiring that you understand complex numbers already, without requiring that you understand all of the details. Um, I remember uh, back uh, when we started teaching physics first, and I often like to think, you know, can we teach quantum first? How do we start to educate these, uh, what seem like counterintuitive ideas, because we learn classical first, <laughs> maybe we start to shift and we can learn quantum first. Uh, but indeed, when we look at the workforce, we have such a need. And as was pointed out early by earlier by Charlie, right, we have many job postings now, and we don't have the talent and the pipeline to fill them. And no doubt, we don't have a diverse pipeline to fill these roles. So we need to really focus on increasing that pipeline. We have to start early, as early as kindergarten, and um, educate to the skills needed. Indeed, we need more than just physics, um, but I don't want to under, kind of underemphasize the need for educating the physics as well, right? So we need to teach uh, computational thinking. We need to understand computer programming. You know, when you think about learning a language, learning a language doesn't just mean learning a foreign language you need to learn programming languages. And those programming languages now, you have an opportunity to extend, it, to extend that into the quantum realm, right? Learn a quantum programming language early. Let's teach those early. Let's teach that computational thinking and a thinking about different types of instructions, different abstractions, right? You compute differently with a quantum computer. We need to learn that early and figure out how to teach that early uh, so that we can fill this, this pipeline uh, and really inspire a, a next generation, an early generation of what you might call quantum mechanics, right, that touch every aspect. Uh, we have a real, um, a real lack of understanding in some sense of the types of applications we'll be able to run on, on these machines. And what, what can we do with quantum sensors, data coming from quantum sensors, and then you know, transferred via a quantum network to a quantum computer, right? This, these are entirely new technologies that will be coming together over the next several years and the, you know, decades to come. Um, so educating to every aspect of that stack, not just uh, the quantum materials and the, and, the, and the physics side, but also that computer science side, the computational thinking side, and learning about those different abstractions. That's all. Wonderful um, commentary on that. And um, before we move on to the next question, I wonder if any of the panelists want to chime in uh, on that. Yes, I, I, I totally, sorry, go ahead, Gabriella. Oh, please. sorry, I, I, it's, uh, I wanted to say I totally agree with Krista. I, um, I also think that is, is beyond the, the concepts and all of the different aspects of quantum, but also it's about um, culturally responsive teaching in making sure that the materials are being taught in a way that's relevant to students. Uh, more so, I, I think about Sal Khan and, you know, how his whole concept of flipping the classroom. Um, I, I also think that, um, you know, the eternal student question of why do I have to learn this? You know, how is this going to help me in life or how is this going to make a difference is very important. Connecting complex concepts like quantum to real life experiences that students that we're trying to reach can connect to is really key and important because, uh, as Krista mentioned, if you get them excited about quantum and what it means and what it can do, then you inspire them to learn and then you give them the why, you know, uh, it's important to engage in this learning. So that's that's what I wanted to add. I, I, I totally agree with Krista. That's very good. Chandra? Yeah, I totally agree with Krista and uh, Gabby. And the point here also is that we really need to think about all the opportunities that we have at the K through 12 levels. So for example, we have physics teachers, we have computer science teachers and potentially mathematics teachers who could actually be teaching these concepts. And that too, for students at different levels, because even in, for example, physics course, you could have like conceptual physics course or you know, regular physics course and then AP level or honors level courses. And we need to think very uh, creatively about how we can connect with students' initial knowledge and actually have our learning goals and objectives in such a way 
and design instruction and pedagogies and curricula that will connect with those students at those levels while being cul culturally responsive, like Gabriela is saying. That's very good. And, and I think this really dovetails really well into the next question I want to ask, which was for James, which is to talk about some of the challenges and successes of teaching um, QIS to high school students. You know, you have some experience in that. So maybe you can start there for us. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this has actually been a really nice thing is that we actually had an opportunity to teach um, at one of the local high schools. And I think all the comments that we just heard from our panelists about um, making sure that things are done equitably, uh, making sure that we have this uh, enough industry and people capable of carrying on uh, the next wave of quantum industry, right? But I think with high school, um, one of the interesting parts, and in, I think of teaching in general, is really making sure you have the materials first laid out, making sure you have something to teach. So having AAPT put together um, a quantum book is a really nice thing to have sort of things like that to kind of engage with. Um, for us, we made this entire platform to allow people to program and also engage with the quantum information at the same time. So that way you're picking up skills of Python while you're learning the basics of quantum information science. I think that was one very important thing about teaching in general. So this entire idea of QBraid came out of this idea of having open learning spaces. So I think making open learning spaces that allow people to go in and then engage with whatever they find most engaging. What we found was that abstract thinking problems from quantum really help people become engaged. I think one of the things that's most interesting about um, what was what uh, Krista was saying in her response was um, thinking about this, this question of how do we actually get people to visualize these things? How do we get people to, to understand them? And then how do we make sure this becomes something accessible for everyone? So with the original poem, with the original digital technology people, um, you can see there's a large divide between people who have access to the internet and people who don't. Now that we're making quantum information science and we're having this opportunity to have a discussion about how we want to teach it, how we want to implement it, what the applications are, we also have a nice opportunity to think about how to make it equitably shared across different high schools with different income brackets, different areas. And I think that's something that we wanted to think about. At, um, and so I would say, yeah, main thing is just teaching. Um, how do we make sure the high school students are engaged, what materials we have there for them, and then making sure it's equitable to make sure people around the world can, um, or not around the world, but around the country and different access points can, can access it. So I think this is um, what, what we had about challenges so far teaching high school. Mm -hmm. That's very good, James. And I actually want to connect this to a question for Chandra and then have everyone chime into the, both of these, which was, what are the steps we can do to make sure that we're developing that kind of best curricula that uh, James was referring to and those proper resources? I know you're already through AAPT working and thinking a lot about this problem. Right. And in fact, you know, that is something that AAPT is really excited about also. And in fact, this is one of our four top priorities at AAPT, quantum education and uh, developing curricula and pedagogies and also prof doing professional development. Now, I want to point out that, you know, in order to develop these curricula, we really need good partnership between people from higher education and, you know, pre-college pre people, right? I mean, so K through 12 teachers. And in order to have this partnership, again, it needs to be equitable and inclusive. Nobody should actually feel like I know more or should be dominating the situation because the point is K through 12 teachers actually know their students. They know exactly, you know, what is the, their initial knowledge, what they are able to do. So whenever we are developing curricula and pedagogies, we really need to be respectful and uh, you know, value what the teachers are contributing to and treat them as equal partners as opposed to dominating those situations. And the same kind of thing is true. So I think when we think about equity and inclusion, I think that those aspects are also really important. And again, doing professional development, again, even if the professional development is being done with partners in partnership with high, higher education people, it needs to be done in a way where teachers are actually energized they are valued and their ideas are actually respected. So I think that these kinds of things, you know, when we are doing partnership, we need to really be very cogent of. And I think that I am really excited about this whole thing because every time I have done outreach at any level, what I have found is that kids in elementary school, middle school, high school, everywhere, they are so excited when they hear about quantum computing, quantum teleportation, or whatever thing. I mean, the level of ex excitement is tremendous. And this is something that we can really capitalize on. So I think that I'm really excited about developing curricula and pedagogies and with the evaluation that I'm doing for Mark Hannum and Karen Jo Messler's 
professional development programs, we are already starting to discuss the need for what kinds of curricula and pedagogies we really need to have in order to actually make these professional development activities even more meaningful to the teachers and the students. That's very good, Chandra. And I'll point out that we do have many high school teachers on the line and many were engaged in the core concepts workshop that was put on last March. In fact, one of the probably the best comments that came out of it came out of Chris Wright from Baltimore um, School System, and we really appreciated his insight. Uh, others want to comment on this topic. I'll add a few comments. Um, first, to all the educators who are on the line, a huge thank you for your commitment to students and our youth. Um, thank you. Thank you for inspiring them to think about this field and hopefully go into this field uh, after, after all the work we do together. Um, but a big thank you to you. Uh, I want to comment, uh, just build on some of what Chandra just um, outlined. I think there's a real opportunity here to also, you know, piggyback um, on some of the work uh, that, you know, large corporations are doing and also look at curriculum in, in different kind of, you know, bite-sized pieces. Um, so how will we have, for example, a full year-long course or look at adding something to APs or, it, you know, and so forth, but also how do we have bite-sized curricula for different levels of uh, education where you can have a little, you know, curricula in a box, right, a, a one day, maybe, you know, one day deep dive or even just a single, um, a single lesson to add across much, uh, you know, a, a broader set of curriculum. So I think it's important that we look at even adding the knowledge of, say, quantum information science or quantum computing in existing curriculum and then also look at broadening uh, to look at longer uh, sets of curriculum. Uh, one piece here I want to mention, for example, at Microsoft, we have the Microsoft Teals program which is a high school computer science program where Microsoft employees go into the classroom for computer science courses. And through that, for example, I've taught uh, a single quantum computing lecture as part of TEALS at some of the local high schools. So there's an opportunity to bring, for example, a bite-sized piece of quantum information to those students uh, and piggyback on those programs. We also have something like, you know, we have Microsoft Education and we also have Minecraft for Education. So there's also an opportunity to look at how we use games and different medium uh, for learning about quantum computing, quantum information science, uh, and quantum physics. And I think that's a really exciting direction as well. One that, of course, is very exciting for, for uh, students around, uh, around our country, right, to get involved in games and, you know, making it more tangible. Um, that, 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 that's, that's really fantastic. And I'll say one of the things um, about the partnership is many of the companies are looking to do exactly what you're doing, is going after the high schools. Some of them are not in a position to generate some of those resources, so if we can come together and find ways to share and connect, that'll be really wonderful. Um, I want to turn to talking actually about how we do this sort of at the national level. Maybe, Gabby, you can talk a little bit more about how can we build this at scale? What are some of the challenges? I know you launched uh, recently the Million Girl, uh, Million Girl Moonshot program. And maybe you can mention that and talk about how you can connect Quan to that. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I, I, I've, I've been a student of Collective Impact for a while. I, I failed to mention earlier, I, I've been pursuing my PhD at Arizona State University for the better of the last decade on a part-time basis uh, during my free time. Um, and uh, uh, one of the things that I, I lo I've learned uh, through practice and research both is that uh, any type of effort that requires this much heavy lifting, because this is a tough problem. This is not something easy. Um, it requires a lot of collaboration. We can't do this in isolation and we can't do this alone. Even companies like Intel, Microsoft, you know, IBM, we can't do this alone. We, we need the, the efforts, the strengths, the assets, the collective intelligence of everyone who's committed to this, um, uh, to this effort in order to really, uh, uh, as my, my friend Jeff Well would say, uh, bust the gauge. We're, we're past moving the needle. So uh, the Million Girls uh, Moonshot is, is a movement which connects the dots and brings on partners who can collectively not only fund, uh, funding is definitely one of the pieces, everybody needs funding, but also bring 
thought leadership, uh, the, the power of our employees through volunteering, uh, for example, mentoring, role modeling, uh, delivering, uh, 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 you know, those size, uh, the bite size uh, activities hands on that are so important. We have uh, future skill challenges that uh, provides a, a problem statement and allows the students to think through the solution by using design thinking skills and, uh, and, and some of the basic concepts. Um, so uh, for the Million Girls Moonshot, uh, uh, we realized, uh, I think uh, early on, uh, we, we started at, at Intel with the She Will Connect initiative, which uh, changed the game for us in terms of how we fund it. Uh, we were funding individual organizations, all of the nonprofits that seek funding through grant making. And uh, everybody who was sort of working in isolation and on their own, on their own programs, on their, in, you know, through their own geos. Uh, and, and so what we did first was to um, uh, develop a request for proposals that require nonprofit organizations to work together and to, to apply together and to synergize their efforts. Uh, you would think, oh, you know, uh, the funding is there and you're gonna get lots of applications. You'd be surprised that, you know, how many people are willing to work together. Uh, uh, and, and so it was, it was a, 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 I think, a, an aha moment for us uh, to realize that not everybody is ready uh, uh, to work together. So collaboration, uh, you know, as we talk about partnerships, it's, it's not easy either. Uh, to have good collaboration, uh, as I mentioned, you, you need that collective impact. You need to have a common set of metrics. You need to have a, a common set of objectives. You need to have a common set of uh, shared values and uh, be able to, to uh, agree on a lot of different things or methods and approaches, uh, which is often what kind of breaks down partnerships. Uh, they're also hard to sustain. So uh, when we were thinking about all of that for the Million Girls Moonshot, uh, again, we brought on uh, just powerhouses of philanthropy, like, uh, you know, the STEM Next Opportunity, which is the legacy Robert Noyce Foundation, uh, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, and, and more importantly, the Charles uh, Stuart Mott Foundation, which has invested over $300 million in an after-school infrastructure for all 50 states. Uh, infrastructure is one of the things that companies like Intel uh, it cannot do on its own. Uh, you know, being there for each state where we don't have facilities, where we don't have a site, where we don't have employees, it's really important that we reach every single nook and cranny, the rural community across each state. So the uh, MOT uh, uh, network of after school uh, alliances uh, has enabled and empowered us to be able to do that. Uh, and so when you think about scale is you have to think about who are the partners that you need that have the assets, that have what, you know, the strengths that, that you're lacking in your, your collaboration to really make it work. And that is also sustainable uh, right. uh, at the same time. Yeah, that's fantastic. And actually, I want to, before we wrap up here, I want to just go to James real quick. James, I believe you're part of another program involving HBCUs and an initiative there to make this kind of outreach that uh, Gabby has just mentioned. And maybe you could just spend a couple of seconds just talk, mention that to us for, please. Yeah, so um, I'm a graduate of uh, Morehouse College. Um, this is HBCU. And there was a recent initiative by IBM to support um, bringing quantum information to HBCUs. I'm on the advising board for that. And um, and it's very exciting to kind of think about the national perspective, as you asked at the previous question, kind of how do we actually institute these things across the board. Uh, it's very glad to hear about, you know, private, um, public, and academic partnerships of, of this sort that are really bringing everyone together to help think about how we can help build up the workforce in, of course, an equitable way. But I also think one thing that I think asked at the beginning was what was the impetus for making the QIS workforce? And one of the things that I think about quantum information science, having been trained inside of quantum information science, worked in it, trained other people inside this area, is that it's a very broad-based training, that you have a lot of directions you can go in, that once you start learning, even if you start learning in high school, quantum information science, whether it's a course on the implementation, whether it's a course in CS or a course in the physics, you're learning about all three of these things at the same time. And then you're getting a very broad base of education that can kind of branch you out into different areas that you'll be more interested in or less interested in as you go forward. But I think giving that 
big broad based background and also building in the teamwork is something that I think is really behind a lot of these drives to make these initiatives where you have a lot of partnerships coming together, a lot of people working together where you learn about teamwork at a very early age and you're able to carry it from high school all the way through to industry. And that's really, um, um, I guess this more in the college side, HBCUs, historically black colleges, universities. But I think nonetheless, the idea is to bring as many people as possible and make sure that as many people can be involved into the quantum um, revolution, people can be as involved as possible, um, drive innovation, drive technology, drive technique. So. Absolutely. So I want to wrap up and give you each of you 10 seconds. Go ahead, Chandra. Societies like APT can play a key role in also making these things scalable. And in fact, you know, Mark Hannum is already involved in the teacher professional development. And in fact, IBM has already partnered with us in that particular uh, project. And basically, the teachers are using the uh, quantum experience Qiskit learning tools. But I think professional develop, uh, development through professional societies could be really a good way to go for making things scalable. Uh, absolutely. Um, Krista, maybe a 10 second comment? <laughs> Sure. Well, thank you again uh, for the invitation today. I just want to close with, I have a two-year-old daughter, and my dream is that when she reaches college, she will have been educated in quantum information science, that she'll be thinking quantum first, and that her first language is Q-sharp. I want to see that dream become a reality, and I'm really excited to working with all of you on, on achieving that. Absolutely. And uh, Gabby, maybe one last comment, 10 seconds. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I agree with Krista. I think we need to be thinking about the next generation and who are, who, who's left behind, who's excluded, because I think in this day and age, we can't afford to leave anyone behind. I think that's a fantastic way to end. We, I, I want to thank all four of you for joining us and giving us your knowledge. Um, this has been really fantastic. In the sense of time, I'm going to turn it to Tomash to wrap it up for us. Thank you again, everybody. Tomash. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Corey. Thank you all. Um, a few comments uh, before we move on to the next part. The, the ongoing quantum revolution is continuously bringing us exciting wonders of scientific discoveries, but also it opens our eyes on opportunities and challenges such as the need for qualified workforce, making sure everyone is involved and included in the effort and can benefit from it in assuring we provide our children with quality education to develop quantum intuition, education which is effective and tailored to actual needs. On, on a personal note, I am now a happy bureaucrat, but I used to be a condensed matter physics scientist. So I really enjoy reading about the pretty much every day a new discovery is being made. It's exciting times. People are finding new ways of increasing coherence of stage, designing new QB platforms. There is just no end. And uh, progress made in fundamentals is absolutely amazing. But I also think of QIS as this beautiful, shiny, fast speed train that goes across the world. And um, we need to make sure everyone can get a ticket, everyone can get a seat on this train. Now, this inclusion starts at K-12 education. That's why K-12 is so critical and important and also difficult uh, to solve, but not impossible if we work together. And here, everyone has a role to play. Everyone is invited to be involved. And it's really easy to start. For example, you could go to q12education.org, that is q12education.org, and click on Get Involved and you can be involved because together we can change the world one qubit at a time and one kid at a time. Now at this point, on behalf of the organizers and stakeholders, I would like to thank you all for participation in the open session of our meeting.